Welcome to PCAP's seventh annual Praise Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Ian Natowich and Sandra Walker will be speaking about remembering the prairies and a path to wild food. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they've worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Before we get going, I'd like to mention that there are four other webinars happening this week for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Topics include wetland drainage, biodiversity and habitat, pollination, and carbon sequestration. So join us this afternoon for a webinar by the Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association about biodiversity and habitat. And you can register for these webinars on the PCAP website. Just click on Upcoming Events and Prairie's Got the Goods Week. And our past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. And this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. And a reminder to our listeners out there, or if you're new, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and then questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor is Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and in-kind support has been provided by Wanaskewan Heritage Park. So, a little bit about today's presenters. Ian is Wanaskewan's Resource Management Technician, holding a Bachelor's Degree in Renewable Resource Management and a Master's Degree in Soil Science, both from the University of Saskatchewan. Much of Ian's research has been focused on concepts of ecological restoration, specifically restoring industrially disturbed sites in northern Canada's low Arctic tundra. Ian is excited to take a break from the cold Arctic and return to studying and working in Saskatchewan's grasslands, forests and wetlands. Sandra Walker has worked as an educator in Saskatchewan for major local nature centres, school systems and Wanuskewan and has taught numerous workshops. She encourages fellow enthusiasts to foster a respect for nature and help them understand there's all, there are ways to feed and support themselves beyond the supermarket. She's also a nature columnist and author of several publications and educational plans for the Native Plant Society and the Saskatchewan Archaeology Society. Sandra is the author of the book, The Path to Wild Food, pu published by Lone Pine. So with that, I will pass it over to Ian. All right, and so can everyone see my screen all right? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Ian Natowich. I am the Resource Management Technician for the Wanuskewan Heritage Park. I'm very excited to be here with everyone today to talk about remembering the prairies. Now, this whole presentation really got started off of a comment that one of our elders had made during a recent Elders Council meeting in which he said, when you've forgotten your history, you've lost your future. And I thought that was a particularly poignant sentiment, especially when we apply that to the current state of our grasslands, because uh, I've started to develop a bit of a fear that we may be starting to forget about our grasslands. And when we start looking at the stats of grassland degradation, that fear becomes a little bit more pronounced. So starting off, 53% of the Great Plains remain intact. And intact is a really critical word there. Because all that means is that 53% of the Great Plains have not been ex uh, uh, converted to agricultural use or uh, urban development. Now, of that 53% that remains, 87% is rated as poor or marginal quality land. So really, the major reason that we haven't converted the rest of the Great Plains is because it's not necessarily productive enough for us to do so. Now, again, intact also doesn't mean uh, or represent anything uh, about other sources of anthropogenic disturbance, such as contamination or influx of invasive species. So when we start looking at this in a, a bit closer lens and a bit more holistic, those numbers become even more worrisome. 
with about 97% of our tall grass prairies, 64% of mixed grass, and 66% of short grass prairies being considered damaged, degraded, or destroyed, and in need of some sort of ecological restoration to bring those systems back to a healthy state. Now, with all these stats, uh, I started running the probabilities in my head, and I started asking myself the question, have I ever experienced a true grassland? Have I ever had that experience of walking through a truly pristine, native, uh, and undisturbed grassland environment? And unfortunately, I, I think the odds are against me in that I may not have ever actually experienced that system. Now, that got me asking a question that I want to now ask everybody in the audience, and that is very simply, do we know what a prairie is supposed to look like? Do we know what species are supposed to be there and what species aren't? And to really uh, underscore this point, I kind of want to be everybody's least favorite science teacher and issue a little bit of a pop quiz. So very simply, I want you to try and figure out what of the following species on your screen are native species to the Canadian prairies. And I'll give you a few seconds to try and formulate your answer there. Now, this is our easiest section of this uh, quiz, animals. Most people are familiar with them. If you were able to note that B, the wild boar, was the odd man out and the invasive species, well done. Let's move on to something a little bit more challenging and talk about wildflowers. Do you know which of these, native spe or these species are native to the Canadian prairies? And again, I'll give you a few seconds here. Now, I think I may have tripped a few people up on this one, but if you were able to see that A, C, and E are our native species and that B, D, and F are invasives, well done. Let's move on to the hardest part of this quiz and talk about the predominant component of our Canadian prairies, grasses. Do you know which of the following are native species to the Canadian prairies? Now, I will admit I was a little bit trickier with this question because there is only one invasive or native species on there, the humble blue grandma. Now, if you weren't able to get 100% on this little quiz, don't worry. That wasn't the purpose of this quiz to make you feel bad or make you feel like you're being judged. This, the purpose of this quiz was kind of twofold. One, I wanted to demonstrate how easy it is to start associating a lot of those invasive species that have begun to dominate our grasslands as being part of that natural community. And two, I wanted to show how easy it is to forget about some of those individual components that make up our grasslands. Now, in that whole idea of the, the fear of being forgotten, I wanted to talk briefly about Wanuskewin, because I think Wanuskewin is an excellent case study on the realities of that fear about being forgotten, as well as some of the challenges and difficulties associated with trying to restore or bring something back that nobody really remembers. So to start, for those of you who aren't aware, Wanuskewin did go through a period of being forgotten. In 1902, this land was first purchased uh, with a private um, uh, homestead put onto the property and our prairies converted to agricultural use. Now, it wasn't for 30 years afterwards until someone finally recognized Wanuskewin's importance. And that recognition was largely based on the few remains on the soil surface uh, that still showed that this land had some history, such as our medicine wheel and a few scattered teepee rings. Now, even after that recognition of Wanuskewin's importance, it took another 50 years before we had our first archeological dig on site, a tradition that continues today. Uh, that makes Wanuskewin uh, Canada's longest running archeological dig site. And over those 40 years of archeological digs, we have recovered a ton of information about Wanuskewin's history with an archaeological timeline going back 6,400 years and showing evidence of nine different pre-contact indigenous cultures having uh, either occupied or visited this landscape at some point. So we have spent 40 years trying to recover Wanuskewin's history, and we've done an awful lot of great work, but we know that we're still scratching the surface, evidenced by the recent discovery of four petroglyphs on site. As you can see, these petroglyphs were not necessarily all that hidden, only being a few feet away from our bison fencing and maybe about 500 meters away from our main complex. 
So even though we have put in a ton of work to Wanuskewin, we know that those challenges about being forgotten may not ever be fully resolved. So how do we apply this to our prairies and how do we start remembering our prairie systems? I think this largely comes down to three major things. One, reinstating those natural grassland drivers that led to the development of these grassland ecosystems over the past few thousand years, as well as a lot of small scale management, the things that you might associate with kind of daily duties as a land manager, you know, removal of invasive species, rangeland health assessments, or in this photo's case, getting ready to lower the water levels of the Apimaha Creek. Now, finally, I think this might be the most important thing is to redevelop those personal connections to the landscape. So moving forward, I wanna talk a little bit about what Wanuskewin has been doing to reinstate those natural grassland drivers, uh, as well as how we have been developing those personal connections to the landscape through those restoration efforts. So starting, this is a really complicated topic on what drivers led to the development of grassland ecosystems, but it can largely be boiled down to the influence of three major factors, that being drought, fire, and grazing. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about drought just because it's something that we don't necessarily have to reinstate, so I want to start with talking about fire. The first thing I want to mention about fire is that this is a perfectly natural disturbance event. There is more than enough evidence to show that uh, unusual weather events such as dry thunderstorms can result in the development of these grassland fires and that these fires happened very frequently over the past few thousand years, with most of our grasslands having a fire interval of about 5 to uh, 15 years. Second thing I want to mention about fire is that we are living in a fire deficit, meaning we're simply not putting enough fire back on the landscape to regain a lot of those positive benefits from fire. Uh, and a lot of we're starting to see uh, a lot of unfortunate uh, results of not having fire on the landscape, such as litter accumulation and woody encroachment, all of which are leading to some really significant and very intense wildfires. Now, in terms of what those fires can actually do for our grasslands, again, a whole host, uh, a, a topic in of itself, I'm just going to briefly introduce some of the key features. So uh, the first one, a fire is really effective at introducing heterogeneity into our plant communities, meaning that we generally have an increase in biodiversity with how patchy those landscapes are. Fire can also reduce the presence of large woody species and remove a lot of those invasive species that haven't had that time to adapt to these frequent fire events. And there is generally a positive response of wildflowers in terms of biodiversity and increased forage quality from a lot of our forbs and grasses post fire. So what has Wanuskewin been doing to try and re-implement this natural ecosystem driver? Well, very simply, we've started introducing fire to our landscape. This is a picture from just this past October where we were able to successfully burn off, uh, conduct our first prescribed burn in five years. Now that uh, event was part of the first grassland fire training and experience event that was hosted in Canada. It was hosted by the Canadian Prairies Prescribed Fire Exchange and the Mewasan Valley Authority. And it brought 11 agencies from all over Canada and over 40 individuals together so that we could share that fire knowledge, share that fire science, and importantly, work cooperatively to burn over 250 acres in the immediate area surrounding Saskatoon. So I have a ton of examples and personal stories from this event. I thought it was a really critical moment in my development of getting more familiar with being on a fire line. But uh, instead of talking about those, I wanted to talk about one individual's experience because I thought it was particularly profound. So before we began our fire, I went to our elders council and I asked them if they had any advice or recommendations they would be willing to give in regards to putting fire back on the landscape. They highly recommended that before we started our burn, I give an offering of tobacco back to the land. So before we started our fire, I took a small moment aside to myself and gave that offering of tobacco back to the landscape. Afterwards, I thought it was kind of strange that I be the only one doing that. So I gave the opportunity to all of our 20 some participants that day to take a pinch of tobacco and give it back to the land. I was really happy to see that everyone, including the film crew that we hired to commemorate the event, uh, took a small piece of tobacco, went off and had that personal moment with the landscape. 
Now, uh, afterwards, we were able to pull off a very successful burn of about 10 and a half acres. Uh, it was a really, really fun day and a great learning experience. But while we were doing our mop up afterwards, one individual came up to me with tears in his eyes and he was thanking Wana Scalin. And when I asked him what he was being, you know, thanking us for, he said, for the opportunity to give that offering back to the land, telling me that it made him feel um, closer to the memory of his grandmother, which I think we can all agree is a particularly deep, a particularly emotional experience that that individual is forever going to associate with his family, forever going to associate with that burn, and forever associate with Wanuskewin. And I can tell you after my future conversations with that individual following the burn, uh, I don't know if there's anybody more excited to get back out to Wanuskewin, help us conduct more prescribed fires and help us make Wanuskewin a healthier landscape. And that really, really drove home to me the importance of those developing those really deep and personal connections with the landscape. Now, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about grazing. Whenever I talk about grazing, I think people automatically assume that I'm talking about cattle. Instead, I want to talk about the prairie's original grazers and the prairie's keystone species, bison. I think like Wanuskewin, bison are also a perfect case example of kind of that fear about being forgotten. Uh, and I, I think we're all well aware of uh, the near extinction of bison across North America, but I'm not sure everyone is familiar with the actual numbers. And I wanted to dive into that a little while or a little bit because they're kind of wild. So before European colonization of North America, the historical bison population is assumed to be somewhere around 30 to 60 million individuals. After European... Oh, Sorry, there's... Ian, I, I took it a little too soon. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, so yeah, the historical bison, bison population at about 30 to 60 million. Now, after European colonization in 1884, the lowest recorded bison population was noted at 325 individuals, which represents a 99.998% reduction in this critically important species to the grasslands. Now, since that lowest population, uh, both America and Canada have done tremendous work in trying to bring back that bison population, and it's currently sitting at somewhere over half a million individuals, which is tremendous work. But again, it has been 140 years of trying to restore that bison population, and we have yet to get it to reach 2% of its historical population. So uh, what are some of the effects that bison have on our landscape and why do we want them back on the land? They can have really significant influences on nutrient cycling. Uh, like fire, they're very effective at introducing heterogeneity into our plant communities. Uh, and this is just one of my favorite little effects, uh, but bison wallows can create ephemeral wetlands that are really, really critical habitat for a lot of our prairie amphibians. Uh, now, I could go over a, a bunch of stories about what Wanuskewin has done to bring back the bison, but suffice to say, we have done just that. We've brought back the bison. In 2019, we started reintroducing bison onto 480 acres of restored grasslands, and our uh, herd size has now grown to 28 individuals, which I am very, very happy about. Uh, now, in terms of those personal connections, I think everyone here is probably quite well aware that the bison are exceptionally uh, important animals for a lot of First Nation cultures throughout the Great Plains. So instead of talking about that myself, I wanted to give the opportunity for some other members of Wanuskewin to share their thoughts. So we have a video queued up from Tourism Saskatchewan called the Bison Reintroduction at Wanuskewin.
All right, so I hope that video gave everybody a bit of an introduction onto not only how important it was to bring bison back to Wanuskewin in terms of an ecological sense, uh, but also how incredibly important that event was uh, for not only um, that idea of cultural revitalization and cultural healing that the bison represent. Now, moving forward, I, I want to talk a little bit more about small scale management. And really, I just wanted to share one of my favorite stories from working at Wanuskewin this summer. So I was really happy that I was get, uh, able to do something that we called our staff weeding days out at Wanuskewin. Essentially, if you had an hour at some point during the week, throw on a pair of gloves, come outside and help me remove some of the invasive species on our property. And I really loved these events because it gave me a great opportunity to not only talk um, with other staff members at Wanuskewin while being out on that landscape, uh, but it also gave me a bit of an opportunity to act as a little bit of an educator and just provide some information on what these species were, why they were so damaging to our grasslands and how we can effectively remove them from our prairies. Now, one of the species we worked with most frequently is absinthe. And if any of you have ever worked with absinthe before and tried to remove it from an area of land, you understand how dastardly that plant is. So we spent a lot of time working with absinthe and trying to get it out of the park. After a few of these staff weeding days, I had one of our directors at Wanuskewin very excitedly bust into my office one morning and go, you've changed my life. And when I asked him what he meant, he said absinthe. Everywhere I go, I see it, and I have to actively fight the urge to pull over on the side of the road, throw on some gloves, and rip it out. And I really loved that moment, because uh, this is an individual who has been coming to Wanuskewin for years on end, driving in and out every day. And it was only after he got that little bit of educational experience and actual experience working with that plant that he was able to develop that mental recognition uh, of that species and uh, instilled in him this excitement to actually be out on the landscape and helping us make Wanuskeo in a healthier place. So all in all, how do we start remembering the prairies? I think it's very important that we do everything we can to reinstate those natural ecosystem drivers like fire and grazing, as well as a lot of that small scale management. But most importantly, I think it's critical that we provide those opportunities for individuals to get back out onto the landscape and to encourage the development of those deep personal connections. Uh, I've found out here at Wanuskewin that as soon as we do develop those connections, we see not on, only a willingness, but an excitement and a want for people to spend time, of, you know, give a solid chunk of their day to come out to Wanuskewin, help us make this land healthier, and make sure that Wanuskewin is going to stay as a healthy prairie ecosystem for future generations. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your time. I had a pleasure talking with you. I think I'm now gonna hand this over to Sandra Walker, who's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the knowledge that we do still remember about our prairie ecosystems. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here, make sure everything's working. Oh, you can see my pugs there. <laughs> there we go. So, oops, let's get back to the beginning. This is dogwood. You know, I'm, I want to mention that, first of all, uh, native prairie is one of the most vanishing um, landscapes on, on the planet and, and one of the most biodiverse ecosystems that is out there. It's amazing how much is available on the prairies. The big problem is it's only seasonal. Um, this one here is dogwood. So if you're out on the trail and, and you get bit by a bee, a wasp, a mosquito, or a spider, this is the best afterbite you'll ever take. Unfortunately, you have to chew the leaf and it doesn't taste very good, but once you try it once, you'll do it again. You take that chewed up leaf and you put it on the area where you've been bit, that's called a poultice, and it eases the pain right away. One of my sons is allergic to uh, wasps and we were out at the dog park one day and being the good mother I am, I left his medicine in the car, it's parked a mile away. So we tried the dogwood leaf for the first time. It took us 15 minutes to get back to the car. By the time we got back to the car, the swelling was gone. He got bit in the city again on the arm. It took four days for, for the swelling to go away. And I had used Benadryl and Chlortriplon to try and get rid of it. So 
dogwood works much much better it's also used the the branches have what's called pith so you can run a needle through it and you can use it for beadwork it makes it flexible so you can weave it into baskets and those kind of things as well bad joke to remember all of that uh, you can always tell dogwood by its bark sorry <laughs> And so if you're out on the trail and, and you forgot your bug spray, this happens to be uh, pasture sage. You can't eat it, it's too bitter to eat. But if you pick it and rub it on your skin, that will help repel bugs. Nature has everything out there, you just gotta know what you're looking for. And if you forget your sunscreen, no worries. This is a trembling aspen. And the powder on my finger there is sunscreen. My husband's an environmental consultant and he came home really red from the field one day and he says, oh, I forgot my sunscreen. And I said, was there a trembling aspen nearby? He's never come home that red since. Now here's the interesting thing about that. That also will give you your north-south. If you're lost in the woods and you think knowing your north-south will help you, well, um, there is always more powder on the south side of the tree because that's the sunny side. Everybody tells you moss grows on the north side of the tree, not necessarily true. It grows in shady areas, but there will be always more moss on the, the north side. So if you find a trembling aspen with moss and powder, you'll have your north south perfectly. Poison ivy. Now, if you're out on the trail and you run into this, leaves of three leave me be. Here's the thing about poison ivy, it actually has a use. Um, if you take the woody stem, if you look at the lower part of the, the, the plant there, you, you'll notice it always has a woody stem. If you clip that woody stem and you dab it onto a wart, it will kill the wart virus. But uh, if nature has an irritant, it has a remedy. This is snowberry or buckbrush, another common name for it. Take that berry right there and rub it on your skin and squish the berry and rub it on your skin and then it'll get rid of the irritation. The other thing you can use uh, snowberries for, it, it's a, a fabulous decongestant. Um, doesn't work for everyone, granted, uh, but at any rate, no more than four because technically it is a poisonous berry. And you want to swallow them like a pill. One of my colleagues asked me once when she was really stuffed up, what would work for a decongestant, and I said snowberry, but I forgot to tell her to swallow them like a pill, and she chewed them. If you swallow them like a pill, it takes 20 minutes and your ears will clear, you know, how when you're that stuffed up. But if you chew them, it pops in five minutes, but she said it was like swallowing pins and needles, so it's up to you how you want to take it. This is the edible sage. Now, you can use this one also for, for bug repellent too by rubbing it on your skin, but you can eat uh, the prairie sage that's um, turkey dinner with sage is truly a First Nations meal. I have to admit that's why I got into ethnobotany was because First Nations cultures foods got wiped right off the map. And it's not that they weren't good, it's just agriculture took over. Um, this is wild onions, one of my absolute favorites. When I first started as an ethnobotanist, I couldn't tell a wild onion until it was in flower. Now, the moment they pop up out of the ground, I know they're the, what they are. Now, I have a lot of this stuff growing in my backyard on purpose so that I don't have to harvest from nature. And I, I've been collecting my seeds and taking them back out to some of my favorite wild spaces. This is prickly pear cactus. We have two types of prickly pear cactus. There's the other one. It's the one plant that First Nations planted on purpose and where they planted it was around the poles of their sun drying rack. And uh, that way the mice couldn't run up the poles and steal their food. Isn't that a brilliant way to protect your food? If you singe the needles off of that, it, it tastes very similar to okra. And then after the flower is done, that's the pear part. And the pear part tastes really similar to papaya actually. And the seeds are all the way through it. And in parts of Southern United States, archeologists were finding um, occupational sites, which where people were living that had a large ring of cactus around it. And at first they thought it was to protect the people in the sites, but that's not what was going on. People were eating the prickly pear cactus and they went to the loo and they took a poo. Well, guess what grew? And that's how it got there. So this is um, pincushion cactus. And when the, that that turns into the the, the flower part turns into a, a berry almost, it's called deer berry, and that too is also edible. This one here's got to be at least a hundred years old, and that's in a place called Round Prairie, just uh, 20 minutes south of Saskatoon. Bed straw, that's edible. Um, you can use it like a spinach. 
But you can also take the flower and sprinkle the pollen onto your pillow and it'll help you fall asleep. Um, it was also used for that and, and stuffing beds. So that's how it got the name bed straw. This is lamb's quarter, a member of the goosefoot family. And, and this was a major crop used by um, both North and, and South American First Nations, um, eating the, the, the leaves as a spinach. Um, the seeds heads are, are related to quinoa actually. So in, in South America, the plant is um, a member of the quinoa family, but it, it was widely used throughout North America as well. This is fireweed. Again, you can make a jelly out of the, the, the flowers and the young shoots are edible as well. And the reason it's called fireweed, it's one of the first things that sh shows up after a forest fire um, and rejuvenates the forest. This is milk. We, we, we don't have either of those at Wanaskewin and I don't want to see them there either because technically they wouldn't be on a landscape like this, that, that, that's milkweed but it is native in the south end of Saskatchewan and good for the monarchs. It is poisonous, but if you, you cook it, then it's edible. You can make fritters out of the flowers. This is uh, blue flax and native to Saskatchewan as well, and a widely used crop by First Nations. They use the seeds for baking, or well, not necessarily baking, but in, in, for cooking and those kind of things. Goldenrod, you can use the yellow flower heads for a dye and the seed heads, if ground into a finer powder, can be used to thicken up your soups and stews. You can also make a tea out of it and it's an anti-nausea medicine. This is, um, my next book is Revenge on Your Weeds, so some of these, but Shepherd Purse is, is native to, to Saskatchewan as well. Uh, has a peppery flavor and is quite delicious. You can use the leaves as well. Wild asparagus is not native to Saskatchewan. Chet will really resent me for having this one in here, but they're yummy, so we'll skip on. Now, this is Indian breadroot, which is an important crop for the First Nations. You'd move your entire camp for this plant, and what grows on it is a tuber, um, which is about the size of your fist to the, as thick as your thumb, and it was ground into a flour and used as a porridge, um, used as a potato. It can also be eaten raw. And this plant actually has a very symbiotic relationship with the bison. And so the area where our bison were was uh, heavily agriculture and we did reseed it with native plants, but this was the one forb that was missing. And so I asked to make sure that the bison ate it because this plant has that symbiotic relationship. The seeds are really hard to break open. So they like to go through the digestive system of the bison and then grow and you know what later. And so at any rate, they agreed and, and I went out and followed the um, old trails where the bisons, if you're at one escape and you notice those zigzag trails that go up the hillside there, that's the original trails that the bison used to get up the hills. And that's where all the breadroot is. And so I handed the bison manager an envelope full of breadroot heads and he fed them to the bison and apparently they eat them all. So we're gonna do that for a couple of summers to help replace it. And really, if you want to have the the prairie replaced, it's the bison will help replace it a lot. That and natural fires. This is wild licorice, and we do have it at Wanaskewin. Um, it's the root of the plant that you're after, and this is um, like black licorice, is what it, it tastes like, and it is what you make black licorice from. Uh, First Nations used to dig up the root, and you can chew it, and it becomes quite fibrous. You can use it to brush your teeth with. It's a plant we refer to as being circumpolar, and has been used all the way around the world for toothbrushes in many cultures. There's some uh, food that's a wild licorice uh, recipe for pork roast, it's quite tasty. Um, doesn't have that black licorice flavor, it comes out quite sweet actually. Now, goat's beard, I, I, I know that there is a native version and, and this is um, one that, that uh, Ian just said is, is there is a native version here too though. This is also an invasive species. But the thing about goat's beard is supposedly you can eat the root and it's supposed to taste like oysters. Well, maybe if you're a beaver, you can eat it. So what I ended up doing was making fritters out of the flower buds. Western mm, tiger lily is uh, uh, another crop that was majorly used by First Nations. It's the bulb. And again, it must be cooked before eaten. However, this is our provincial plant and you need to know what is listed and what's not. And so if it's growing in nature, please just leave it where it is. This is scarlet mellow. This is one of my favorites. 
the root system on it, um, it, it handles droughts quite readily. And what it does is when the root system does get moisture, it expands, it, it, it actually swells up. And when I used to be able to hand out people samples, I would give them some powder that ground up from the root and I'd tell them to leave it in their mouth for a few moments and you'd feel it actually foaming up. That's what they used to make marshmallows out of now, it's all corn syrup. This is sarsaparilla. We don't have it at Wanaskewin, but in other sandy areas um, like Beaver Creek and the Cranberry Flats, you'll see a lot of sarsaparilla. People mistake this for her poison ivy. When it first comes up, it does have leaves of three, but it has a fleshy root uh, stem system compared to the woody stem system. This is what you make root beer out of. Wood violets, we have them at Juana Scalens. There's two different varieties. And the flowers actually have a wintergreen flavor. And in the early spring, you can uh, pick the stem the, with the leaf on it and peel out the, the, the leaf. And it, it too tastes like wintergreen candy. They're, they're really quite tasty. Plantain, um, this can be used as a uh, bugger afterbite as well. But I, I have to admit, uh, dogwood works much better. And, but what it does work really well for is eczema. And if you just wilt up the leaf in, in, on a, a frying pan and put it on the area we have eczema, it'll help heal the eczema a lot faster. It is also edible. The leaves are really tough, but there's some chips that I made like kale chips out of it. And they're really healthy. This is yarrow. It too is supposed to be good after bite. It tastes way better than, than the dogwood, but again, dogwood works the best. You can make a tea out of it, and that tea is, is you can drink it. But one of my favorite uses of that tea is when it's cool. Um, you, you dip a cloth in it. If you have a bad sunburn, let that cloth over the area where you have the bad sunburn, and it, and it soothes the pain almost instantly. One of my sons used to burn really easy. We used to use aloe vera, and you'd peel like a banana afterwards. When we started using the yarrow, yarrow it didn't peel quite as bad, and he said it soothed the pain faster. This is silverweed. This was a, a major crop used by uh, First Nations in British Columbia and, and throughout North America. And what grows on it is the root system. It grows no bigger than the tip of your, or your about as big as your baby finger, but it's not there till fall and tastes very similar to spaghetti. And it's becoming one of the, the new superfoods as well. Um, apparently it's really good for babies with colic. So, and it's really easy to grow, spreads easy. Um, again, my next book is Revenge of Weeds. Chickweed is not native to here, but you can eat them. Uh, not this is actually um, a thistle, which thistles are members of the artichoke family, and so all of them actually have a tiny little artichoke in their flower, even smaller than the ones that you can buy. You can also clip off the thorns and eat the leaves on it, and the root systems are really woody, but apparently you can eat them. This is curl dock. If you have touched quite our stinging nettle, this is the cure for stinging nettle, but you can also eat those leaves like spinach and the seed heads were used for cereals and grains as well. They're stinging nettle and it's the tiny little hairs on the plant that will irritate you. Actually, any plant that has a square stem is a member of the mint family. So it's a cousin of the mint family, but um, you can eat it. It's high in potassium. It is good for you to eat. Uh, make a soup out of it. It's kind of like matcha soup, or you can make tea out of it. And it's really good for people with arthritis. Wild mint, and of course teas and and herb, and some more. The other one was peppermint. This is wild mint. Hyssop, which is also a member of the mint family, has a, a licorice flavor to it as well. So teas and and herbs. Bergamot, another member of the mint family, has a square stem, and everybody's probably had it because it's the underlying ingredients in Earl Grey tea. I make a, a jelly with the rose hips and, and the petals of the flower and some of the young tender leaves. Really good on a, a pork roast or a roasted chicken. River birch, anything you can do to a river birch or paper birch, you can do with a river birch. You can tap both these trees and drink their sap. Um, you can make baskets from the bark as well. Manitoba maple, you can also tape, uh, tap it. It doesn't uh, boil up as thick as a sugar maple, but it does have that same flavor. It's a nice dense wood, so a good log to throw in your fire to rebuild your fire from embers. Um, also good for cooking because of the heat. This is beet hazelnut. And um, 
you can eat them, but I highly recommend that you just go to the store and buy them because the, the tiny little hairs on the plant will make you really, really itchy. I picked them and it, the little hairs even went through the glove. And how First Nations used to gather them was they would watch where the squirrel had their stash and then they would raid the, the squirrel stash. And I get why, because it make, that makes you really, really itchy. <laughs> Choke cherries are um, um, a crop used by First Nations quite a bit, because this is one of the, the berries that they used in their pemmican meat. And so they were also dried out in the sun. One of the things they were using the, the, in the pemmican meat when they were doing it, they would leave the seeds in. And when the seed is eaten, it's actually re related to strychnine. So you don't want to eat the center of the seed because it's poisonous. But uh, once you put it on a sun rack, it dissipates the sun. So when they were drying it out, it, it got rid of the, the toxins. High bush cranberries, you can eat these as well. They're high in vitamin C. And if you're walking through the woods and you think you could smell stinky socks, it's actually these berries in the fall. So when you're cooking with them, I recommend you throw a little bit of cinnamon. It gets rid of that funky smell. You can also use those berries for a dye as well. Wild plums, we don't have them at Wanaskewin, um, but I have seen them in the south end of the province and it was a crop used by First Nations. They were making almost like a ketchup with it. They're kind of a really scrubby looking bush. And I have one in my yard. If you keep them well trimmed, you can actually get a decent sized plum on them. There's some plum pudding. Oops, sorry. Elderberry, the, this is a native version of it. There is most of the ones that you'll see is invasive, but you can use the flowers and, and the berries. It does need to be cooked before eating as well. Wild raspberries, and of course, everybody knows how to use them, but you can also use the, the leaves for tea. And it's also um, good tea it is good for, for uh, women's. Uh, Saskatoon berries, of course, the berries are edible and also used in pemmican meat. And if you tend to look at Saskatoon and chokecherry branches, the, the, their main stems tend to grow nice and straight if there's nothing in the way. So that was what they used for their arrows and, and their, their shafts on their arrows and their spears. And they're a member of the apple family. You can always see the star in an apple. There's the star in the Saskatoon berry. This is also a member of the apple family or rose family. Rose hips have more vitamin C than an orange. Um, three rose hips, that's all it takes. But all you want to eat is the, the red fleshy part because if you eat the seeds on the inside, they have microscopic barbs like the branch and it would scrub out your colon just a little too well and you get what's called itchy bum. But, uh, maybe you need it. You can also eat the flower petals. Um, I love to steep the flower petals in honey. And then your, your honey gets a rose flavor and then make baklava with that honey. It's, that's really tasty. This is buffalo berry. And, and here's where I rant about greenhouses bringing in invasive species like sea buckthorn, because this is the native version of, of uh, sea buckthorn. And this one, um, if you take it in, in with some crushed ice and shake it really vigorously, it'll foam up on its own. So you'd have a Slurpee that's good for you, high in vitamin C. First Nations would whip it and it was referred to as um, Indian ice cream. It's just, it foams up, it can't touch, um, you're better to do it in glass, it can't touch plastic or anything like that, then you won't get that foaming action. They actually taste like tangerine oranges and they do need that first touch of frost for the, the sweetness to come out in the berries. Otherwise they're kind of really sour. Hawthorns, and you can see the haw the thorn on that. And if you run into that thorn, that thorn's not going to break. So I think this bush has the wrong name. It should be called the boohoo bush. Um, but that thorn can be used for sewing needles and fish hooks. The berries are also edible. And there's some fish hooks made from the hawthorn. Silverberry. Um, now. There's a poem that'll teach you how to eat berries and it starts with white and yellow will kill a fellow. The next line is purple, blue, good for you. And the last line is red, could be dead. So don't eat them if you don't know what they are. But this is the exception to the white and yellow will kill a fellow because this is survival food. It's not a fleshy berry, it's a powdery berry. And if you rub the powder off of the berry, you'll see the seeds on the inside. And again, that's what First Nations use for bee work. I've made biscuits with them. Um, they get called wolf willow because wolves will eat them when there isn't enough food. And in the middle of winter, they're perfectly viable. 
the Blackfoot Nation use them quite a bit. But when it's in flower, it kind of smells like pea. So it's it's. But the pa the the it berry doesn't taste like that at all. It's actually quite sweet. This, one. this is a gooseberry, one of the first berries in in the summertime, and that too can be used for fish hooks for smaller fish. Black currant and the flowers are different on it. There's different currants, and of course the berries are edible on it. And there's a red currant, and these are all in the lower lying areas of bushes and throughout Saskatchewan. Kaniknik, common in underlying areas in bushes. Um, that berry is also a survival berry because it won't freeze and thaw in the winter, and, and it's a powdery berry used in soups and stews and in dumplings and those kind of things by First Nations. The leaves were also used for a tobacco mix. Juniper berries, you can actually put the juniper in with some flour and some water and that white powdery stuff on it is actually yeast as well. You can use the berries, um, they taste like pepper, they're really good on fish. So uh, these two again are survival berry because they aren't a fleshy berry and technically they're not even a berry, actually they're a miniature pine cone. Bear berry, um, bunch berry or uh, miniature dogwood is what this one's called and it'll have four little berries and those two are edible on it as well. It's not related to dogwood, the bush at all. Wild raspberries, high in vitamin C, not much of a berry but way more flavor than you'd get from a domesticated one. These are native grapes. This is a, a river grape and um, it used to grow in, in most parts of, uh, of Manitoba and Ontario and in parts of southern Saskatchewan. And uh, actually, if you read Explorer's books, it, it covered the riverways and they were quite dark. So if you're out in the woods and you find some grape vines, you, if you chop down that grapevine, you can drink the, the water from it because it's actually quite viable to drink. And of course, you can use the, the berries for jelly and, and makes really good juice. They're not very big grapes on them. This is lichen. You'll be liking the lichen if you're lost in the woods because this is major survival food. It's like taking a multivitamin. It'll give you all the nutrients you need to survive. However, if you notice the orange lichen on this one here, you don't want that. It has protein in it. When you're dealing with proteins in nature, if it's a bright colored protein, it's a warning. It's poisonous. So it's either green, gray, or black lichens that are edible. On John Franklin's first expedition, they run out of food. The only food they can find is reindeer lichen, this one right here. And reindeer lichen, um, they ate it, all six of them survived. Uh, on their next expedition, they come in by sea, they bring canned food. So, so lead, the cans were soldered closed with lead and, and they ate the food and they slowly poisoned themselves and everybody dropped dead. Had they stuck to the lichen, they would have had survivors. But you'll, um, you can also use lichens for dyes as well. I make a flatbread with lichens. If you go to the restaurant, the hearth, and you order their mushroom dip, they have a reindeer lichen on it. They, they refer to it as reindeer moss, but moss is your band-aids. You don't need your band-aids. There's moss. All mosses have a natural count of iodine. And so if you're lost in the woods and, and you don't know the water source and you want to drink it, if you peel some paper birch, you wrap a, a, it into a funnel, stuff it with a bunch of moss, Fill, and then put a layer of charcoal over top of it, run your water through three times, changing out your filter, you have viable drinking water. So it's a, a, a water purifier. Arrowheads, if you stand, and we have lots of these at Wanaskewan, um, the tubers on them are edible. So how First Nations would pick them is they'd go in and just wiggle their toes and the tubers would float to the surface and you can eat them. They taste like water chestnuts. This is uh, cow lilies and, I don't think, oops, sorry, I have a picture of the flower, but the seeds can be popped in like popcorn. It's one of my children's favorite memories because I had them in, in, in our pond and, and we made popcorn with them. Cattails, these are the smorgasbord of all wild foods. This green part is the male part. It's the area that's going to pollinate. The lower part here is the, the female part. That's going to turn brown and fluffy. And if you pull that fluff off, it's really good for starting fires. You get a spark and you get ignition going right away. You can snap off this top green part and eat it like corn on the cob and blanch it. You can collect the pollen and anything you bake with, it stays a bright yellow, has a very unique flavor. Uh, and then in the fall, you can dig up the roots and eat the root system on it as, as well. 
Uh, marsh marigold, this is a good example of sometimes it's edible and sometimes it's poisonous. And as soon as it starts to flower, that's when it becomes poisonous. But you can eat those leaves in the early spring and it's one of the first uh, green plants that comes up. So you're looking forward to that in the spring. But you have to cook it in one set of water, change your water out and cook it again, and then it, it, it is edible. The root system, I've never tried the root system, but it's supposed to taste like sauerkraut. This is a hoof fungus. This is a nature's oven mitt. If you knock this fresh off the tree and hollow out the gills, you can put your embers from your fire in there and transport your fire from one place to the other without feeling the heat and rebuild your fire off of that ember. So back to your Manitoba maple, you can put the, those in. I've seen them get the size of soup bowls. They were also used for starting friction fires and used for personal smudges as well. This is nightshade. There's the exception to the, the uh, purple blue line in that poem, because one of these berries and, and it, they, they'll tell you if you eat enough of them. So this is hemlock. We have a lot of it at Wanuskewin. And what I find interesting is, is in Shakespeare, it was used for murder. Uh, First Nations refer to this as the mercy plant. So there's the difference in it. Um, there was one wild carrot at Wanuskewin, which again isn't native to, to uh, Saskatchewan, but I, I ought not to put it in my book simply because I didn't want people to mistake uh, hemlock for uh, wild carrot because that mistake you're only going to ever make once. So, and I'd like to thank my photographer Ron Heinrichs. Let's, let's go back to the screen there. Did I run over time? I did. So you guys can take it away. <laughs> well, first of all, thank well, you both for the thing. great presentation. Um, we do have a few questions in, so I'll let you just um, chime in whoever um, is best suited to answer it. Uh, so the first question is from Diana. Um, how many acres are the bison given? Uh, so at the moment, um... The the land that the bison are currently residing on is actually leased land um, from the city of Saskatoon, uh, and it was previously agricultural land. So over the past few years, since we've been reintroducing those bison, uh, we've been kind of working at it quarter section by quarter section, uh, and we just finished off the final seeding of uh, our last quarter section for a total of 480 acres. Uh, and we're hoping that in the uh, next year or two, we should be able to open up that entire pasture so that they do have that full 480 acres to roam. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Sandra, uh, there's a few questions about where people can access this information. Um, do you have like any handouts or brochures or everything's in your book? Do you wanna make a pitch for your book? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm doing CD Saturday for community gardens this weekend. So again, it'll be pretty much the same presentation, um, but I don't have quite the timeline. <laughs> so I'll give you more info. Okay, so people can check you out on CD Saturday. Um, yeah. and, and you do have a book, where can people get it? It's at McNally Robinson. One is gay one carries it. Um, it's on Amazon. Um, uh capellas has it and i know canadian tire carries it in the summertime so in the trunk of my car <laughs> okay perfect so people can track you down for that um do you have any recipes in your book i'm looking at some of these things like wow yes. she just yes. says yeah make jelly with this and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of us that, need that, more help than that because most a lot of those books will tell you you can eat it but People need a recipe to learn to play with their food and, and do play with your food because the more you play with your food, the more you learn. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> um, and Ian, how many bison um, is suited for a healthy stocking rate? Uh, so that is not my area of expertise. I'm much more focused on the plant ecology of the park. Uh, that would be a better question for our bison manager. Um, from what I understand, uh, for that 480 acres that we currently have, uh, we're planning on getting to a maximum herd size of about 50 animals. Uh, at that point, we're going to yeah, start looking at solutions for uh, any extra births that we may have. Uh, but at the moment, it's looking like about 50 animals for 480 acres. Okay, awesome. And is there a plan to facilitate the seasonal migration that bison historically had on the prairie? Ooh, that is an interesting question. Um, 
In terms of a specific plant uh, that would be encouraging them to follow any specific area, uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. What I would say for certain is that um, uh, bison seem to have a pretty stark uh, or significant relationship with prior, uh, previously burnt areas of prairie ecosystems. Uh, so I know that in the past, indigenous cultures would uh, burn wide swaths of the prairies to encourage more bison activity centered in those burned areas. Okay. Perfect. I know they love buffalo berry as well in the, the wintertime. They'll they'll be browsing on that quite a bit. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's why the plant got the name. Could be, yeah. Um and Ian, will the bison be harvested ever? Uh that's one thing that we're still um we're still trying to decide exactly what we want to do. Uh, if we do get to that uh, maximum herd size and we do have excess bison, uh, where we have been having some considerations on potentially harvesting those bison and using that uh, as kind of a training and experience event, uh, where we would go over um, how to um, harvest that meat, as well as how to hi uh, tan the hides, kind of using it as more of a, um, a cultural education event. Awesome. And I know That's that um, uh, some of our friends over in the Blood Tribe and the Blackfoot Confederacy, they've been doing some of those same things, and they've had really, really fantastic uh, community turnout for those events. So I think we may be planning on following suit. That sounds great. That would be really neat. Well, stay tuned for that in the future. Um, and Raquel is wondering, can prescribed burns be used to kill invasive species? So it depends on what species you're talking about and when you're going to be conducting those burns. Um, as an example, uh, let's use absinthe just because it is one of our big problematic species at Wanuskewin. Uh, absinthe can be hit particularly hard by fire just because it hasn't developed those adaptations, uh, namely storing a lot of the biomass below ground. Absinthe's uh, uh, budding crown is right at the soil surface. So if you do have a fairly intense and severe spring burn, then you uh, there there has been a lot of evidence to show that that can significantly knock back your absence problems. Okay, that's awesome. What those fires are really good for is is uh, a disease called black knotty fungus, which is systemic from one end of the province to the other. And the problem is all it takes is a bird to land on that part of the branch where the and it, and then he lands on another choke cherry tree or another rosemary, and he spread that. And if we had those wildfires ripping through, that would help control those diseases. It's nature's cleanser. Perfect. Um, and I think the last question for all that we have time for, um, are there any opportunities for people to get hands-on knowledge about prairie plants at Wanuskewin? Absolutely. Um, so this summer, we recently just hired a volunteer coordinator, which we're really, really excited about. Uh, and we have a few events that we are uh, currently planning for this uh, growing season upcoming. Uh, personally, I'm going to be trying uh, to host as many volunteer opportunities as I can. Uh, we like to refer to it as putting a hand to the land. Uh, so I'm looking to get as many hands on the landscape as possible. Awesome. That's I'm also great. Looking for, uh, I'll be looking for volunteers because we're going to put a, a native pollinator section in front of the building and it's one of the weedy sections because of the rhinos and it's really windy there instead of blowing weed seeds let's blow native seeds around <laughs> that's lovely <laughs> um there's lots more questions coming in than we have time for today um but i just there's been lots of great comments um uh, people have said this was fantastic thank you for sharing uh this is brilliant so um i just want to thank you for the brilliant presentation uh, both of you uh this was really great and something really unique that we haven't ever covered yet so thank you both well, thank you very much for the thank opportunity. You. If anybody has yeah. any extra questions, my email is resources at wanaskewin.com. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Perfect. Awesome. And to our attendees, um, thanks so much for catching today's webinar. Uh, we will be uploading it on PCAP's YouTube channel in the very near future. And you can look up resources there and also send out the link as well um, from the video for people who want to catch it again or feel free to share it too. Um, and when you leave today's webinar, if you don't mind filling out our quick one minute survey, we really appreciate it. And we can um, report back to our funders and keep our Praise Got the Goods week going into the future. So with that, thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of your day.
Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much.